Hey guys, let's start with our tissue integrity lecture. Uh, the hardest part for me in recording lectures is always just starting it. So let's just start. We'll see how far we get on this. I have a YouTube video that I'm going to post in Canvas for you to watch on the healing process. And as you can see, I'm practicing my like thumbnails, my clickbait. So, I mean, these are partially funny. <laughs> They're funny to me anyways. Uh, and we'll see because this is what my second one that has this um, type of thumbnail and I'm just trying to learn how to do it. It actually is kind of fun but and a lot of work and then like obviously really cringy and dramatic. So that's fine. I'll keep working on them and we can see how I evolve as a video creator. Anyway, so let's let's do this. We're going to talk about tissue integrity. I love this topic. I love it. And I would have to say Real quick sidebar, this presentation contains a lot of very graphic photographs, so be careful who you're watching this in front of. Many of the pictures in this lecture are my actual own family members. It's kind of funny. I know this is the background behind the injury that occurred, and I can go over all of that with you. So... Really quickly, we will start with um, our little review of the skin. Now you guys have taken patho and anatomy and physiology, but um, let's review the skin. So it's the uh, largest organ in the body. It's a protective barrier. This is kind of the, one of the most important things about remembering why our skin is so important. It's a protective barrier against the outside world. It acts as a shield for any kind of like bacteria getting into us and, and moisture and germs and all of that is 15% per, of our body weight. Um, and it also helps us with thermal regulation, sensation, and metabolism. Now, normally when we're in school, I ask everyone to look around, look around, look around, look around at all the people in the classroom and notice our skin. Now, if you notice your own skin, it's intact, you know, it's smooth, it's healthy, you can like pinch it and it's, um, it's healthy and strong. You're going to notice very, very different types of skin when you start taking care of patients. So get to know what normal healthy skin looks like so that you can really, you know, be geared to assess unhealthy skin or skin that's at risk for an injury. So back to the functions of the skin. So regulating body temperature, it protects us from dehydration and infection. It responds to temperature, pressure, and pain. Um, it excretes water, salt, and urea. It's the synthesis of vitamin D from the sun and our skin. And it's the first defense barrier for our immune response. So here's just another one that um, you guys can pause and read these little definitions here. So impaired skin integrity, that is the nursing diagnosis uh, that you guys could use when you have someone who has a wound or any type of um, skin integrity issue. But impaired skin integrity involves any sort of break in the skin or wearing down of the skin. So a pressure ulcer, we're going to talk a lot about pressure ulcers. They're also called decubitus ulcers, um, localized to the skin and the underlying tissue. Pressure ulcers originate usually over a bony prominence. I'm going to show you in the next slide what I mean by that. And they're caused because when you are, when you have a patient who has sort of impaired skin to begin with, and then they're laying on top of a bony prominence like an elbow or your hip bones or the bottom of your foot, the heel, then it occludes the blood vessels and the capillaries that are in that area. The skin ends up not getting oxygen, so no perfusion is happening in that site. And ultimately you get tissue ischemia or um, lack of oxygen to that area. 
and tissue damage and death over time. Okay, so this slide here, you guys might need to pause this video and look at it a few times because it sort of it sort of takes a while, at least for me, for your head to wrap around this picture. But basically, little guy up here laying down. Let's let's focus. We'll we'll focus on the heel. Okay. We'll focus on the heel. So the heel, you see this arrow here. Well, that's this arrow here as well. So the heel bone is right here. And then the skin underneath the heel bone here is getting pushed and damaged since it's on a hard surface and the bone is right here, then the blood vessels here, as you can see, are being occluded. So there's no perfusion going to this bony prominence here. And our patient is going to end up with a wound there if we don't move that area for them. An exercise I like for you guys to do is next time you are watching TV, um, Rest your heels on the table in front of you and don't move them for as long as you can, you know, manage without it starting to hurt. Once it starts to hurt, I do want you to move your heels, but time it. How long can you leave your heels on that hard table before it really starts to be uncomfortable? So luckily for us, we can easily move our feet, move our heels so that the blood can start flowing to that area again. But for patients who are weak, um, you know, confined to the bed, they sometimes don't even have the strength or the knowledge to, you know, the, the whereabouts to move their, their heels. And so they will get a pressure ulcer and it's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, so this is kind of the diagram with the same, but I'm going to talk about the reason why we want to make sure that our patients do not get a pressure injury right here. So number one, we don't want our patients to get a pressure injury because it can complicate their care for them. So we don't want to compromise our patient's health if there's something that we can do to prevent it, which would be turning them every two hours. That's usually the, the rule in the hospital. So we, you know, we don't want to harm our patients, but secondly, it ends up costing the hospitals huge amounts of money because it is actually considered a never event in the hospital setting to have a patient who came in without a wound and then obtain a wound under our care. That is a never event. And is what that means is that all of the money that now the hospital has to spend on this wound will not be reimbursed to the hospital by Medicare, Medi-Cal. Furthermore, complications can arise from the pressure injury. So let's say it starts as a pressure injury to the back of the coccyx, but then it gets infected because now it's, you know, susceptible to being in, exposed to stool and urine. And then the patient gets like a septic infection and then they end up dying. Well, number one, that's horrible for the patient. But number two, the cost that it would, you know, cause your facility is huge. So skin integrity is actually a very, very, very important subject that you need to start incorporating into your patient care as of day one. Always be turning your patients every two hours, lifting their bony prominences off of the bed with pillows. We did that in positioning, or if we haven't done that yet, we will. Um, so really keep an eye on your patient's skin. So then, um, or another risk factor, this is a friction injury that is also um, impaired skin integrity. You know, this is also a never event. But uh, if you look at this picture, so there's, there's different ways where you can have impaired skin integrity. So there is a shear and friction wound. There's moisture that can cause damage to our patients with fecal and urinary incontinence. Um, it'll cause maceration, 
which makes the skin barrier weakened and leaves it more susceptible to a wound. Um, if the patients can't feel the pain or pressure, they're at very high risk for developing pressure injuries. Because like I said, when we put our heels on the table, we can move them as soon as they start to hurt. But other pa patients who are sensory impaired maybe don't even feel it or they're unable to move. But here, this is um, an example of a shear injury or a friction injury. So a friction injury would be more like a rug burn. Like we've all kind of experienced that when you slide across something and the top layer of your skin gets, you know, injured, scraped off, uh, not an abrasion, but like a, a rug burn. And then the shear is inside. So where's my little pointer? So the shear wound is here. So this, this is showing you a bone. Um, I'm going to say like, this is the tailbone, the coccyx right here. This is the skin right here. And is what happens in the case of a shear injury is if you move your patient in bed incorrectly, this can happen. And why is because your patient is laying flat here, right? You go to move your patient up in the bed by pulling them by maybe their arms uh, and the skin on the bed stays and the bone moves. And in between that gets sheared, damaging the blood vessels and then damaging the skin. So I know it's probably hard for me to get these ideas across in the PowerPoint on Zoom. So we will talk more about this in lab, but I really want you guys to have this lecture material, even though, you know, it is um, long and painful to watch on a YouTube video. So we need to assess our patients for sort of their vulnerability to having a tissue injury. And part of that can be from drawing labs. So a leukocyte count will let us know, you know, kind of how their immune system is functioning. Our hemoglobin levels will let us know if they have enough hemoglobin and hematocrit to be perfusing their tissues. If they're very anemic, they're not going to um, have enough oxygen carrying capacity, you know, even just to start with. So we have to be extra careful with those patients. Our blood co coagulation studies, this would tell us how long it will take for our patient's blood to coagulate if they do get an injury, because if they have a very high coagulation rate, then if they do get an injury, it's going to bleed and bleed. Um, our serum, serum protein analysis, our albumin level, that's probably one of the more important laboratory findings for risk of skin impair impairment because we need protein to have healthy skin and healing wounds. Um, and then the results of a wound culture and sensitivity, we would want to look at those. And as what we would do with that, if I don't go over this later on in the PowerPoint, is if someone comes in with a wound or they have a wound or they, you know, they've obtained, obtained a wound in our care, we will swab the bed of the wound with a cotton up, you know, tip and send it to the lab and they will analyze the organisms within the wound bed so that we can treat it with the proper antibiotics. So here the lab values, we want to make sure that we're looking at albumin and pre-albumin uh, these will let us know um, how vulnerable our patients are to wound, or you know, if they're at risk for not healing properly. And then the dietitian can add protein to their diet. So measures to prevent pressure ulcers. So providing nutrition, proper nutrition. So vitamins, vitamin C. We need protein. We need hydration for our patients. We have to maintain skin hygiene, which means giving them a daily, you know, at least wipe down sponge bath, keeping their peri area very clean and dry, uh, avoiding skin trauma. So this would be properly moving patients in their bed, which we're going to go over in lab, how to move someone up in the bed, 
you know, using a draw sheet rather than pulling them up by their arms and then providing supportive devices. And so supportive devices would be when you would maybe lean them to their side on a 45 degree angle on your two hour rotations of moving your patient from side to side and propping them up with pillows or having heel protectors on their heels. Um, there's all kinds of dressings that you can put over bony prominences that will help cushion that area and protect it from developing a wound. And you really need to be proactive with preventing skin injuries and tissue integrity problems, because once they happen, then it can be hard for your patients to heal. So our nursing diagnosis for planning patient care would be risk for impaired skin integrity. And that would be based on your patient presentation and the Braden scale. So we'll talk about the Braden scale in a minute. Um, impaired skin integrity would be a good nursing diagnosis if your patient already has a wound of any kind. And then client and family education or a nursing diagnosis under that category would be like uh, readiness for enhanced learning or non-compliance, those kinds of things if they're not ready. Uh, to learn about skin healing. So classifications of pressure ulcers. Now we are going to go over this in depth and there will of course be quiz questions on this, but um, when you first become a nurse, you'll have to go through a lot of skin care pressure ulcer classes. And oftentimes in the hospital setting, there will be a specialized wound care nurse who will be the one who does the actual official staging but we're going to talk about the different stages. Um, so we have stage one. This is when you have a, an area over like a bony prominence, let's say uh, the bottom of the heel, the coccyx, an elbow, a hip joint, at uh, the back of the head, but where it is inflamed, but the skin is not broken yet. And one of the classic trademark uh, signs of a stage one pressure injury is that it is red. And if you press on it, it is non-blanchable. You can press on it all you want and it just stays red. It does not change color. I have good pictures of this coming up. Um, stage two is a step further. Um, down the wrong path for tissue injuries. So in stage two, the skin is broken the, either through to the epidermis or the dermis. So a stage two can almost be just a broken blister looking injury. Stage three is a little deeper. It extends to our subcutaneous layer, which if you look on this slide here, it goes into our fat layer. So it's deeper. And then finally we have an, a stage four and a stage four goes all the way down to the bone and there can be undermining, which just means that the wound goes underneath the top layers of the skin. And I have pictures to show you for that as well. Okay. So let's um, let's say that our patient developed a pressure injury and now what happens once we are in the process of trying to get our pressure injury to heal. Once you have a pressure injury or any wound really, you have a decrease in the tensile strength um, of an uninjured skin. And that, that basically means, I mean, if you look on your own body right now, if you have a scar, let's say somewhere, uh, it just doesn't have the same pliability or non previously injured skin strength. So that's called tensile strength, which mean what that means is now that area is going to be sort of weakened forever. So if they had a pressure injury on the bottom of their heel and they're re-hospitalized, that's something that you need to be very aggressive about preventing that from happening again. 
So yes, so it increases the risk for injury. And then once you have a pressure injury, that's uh, once you have a pressure injury that is diagnosed as a stage three pressure injury, it will always be a stage three pressure injury. It will be a healed stage three pressure injury, but it doesn't go from a pressure or a stage three to then a stage two, stage one, and then nothing. So that is something to remember. So we're gonna have lots of pictures of pressure injuries here. And we haven't talked about the unstageable or the deep tissue injury yet, but we will. So let's look again at stage one. So stage one has this reddened, inflamed, non-broken, non-blanchable redness. Stage two, the dermis and the epidermis have been damaged. It's open um, and it has kind of like a blister look. A stage three is deeper, full thickness down to the subcutaneous layer. The stage four can go down into the tendons and the bone, very deep. It can have undermining, which means that the wound will go underneath this layer of what appears to be intact skin. Then we get to this one here, unstageable. An unstageable wound is unstageable because you cannot see how deep the wound goes because it has this big, thick layer of eschar over it, dead ne necrotic tissue. And all of that has to be removed in order for the diagnosis to be made. So unstageable is a, is a very bad injury to have. Then we have our deep tissue pressure injury, or sometimes it's called a suspected deep tissue pressure injury. And the reason why this occurs is because this would be from like a shear friction wound um, or, you know, a shear wound or a deep tissue pressure injury has intact skin. But unlike a stage one where it's red and non-blanchable, it's boggy and maybe even like cool and purple underneath. So you don't know how far down this deep tissue or suspected deep tissue pressure injury goes. Okay, so let's run down the stages of pressure injuries again with different slides. So a stage one has intact skin. It's non-blanchable redness of a localized area. So right over a bony prominence, it would be pretty obvious over the hip, over the coccyx, on the back of the head, on the heels, elbows, anywhere that there's a bony prominence. Darkly pigmented skin may not have visible blanching or the visible redness, and it may, um, the color may differ from the surrounding areas. So it would be like a, a maroon, a dark purple, something of that nature. So here's some pictures of a stage one pressure injury. So these two pictures I got off the stock, but you can see it's a reddened area over the bony prominence here on the coccyx, on the heel. It would be non-blanchable. So if you pushed your finger on this heel, it would not blanch white. It would just stay red. Um, this picture here is my son. And is why he has these non-blanchable stage one pressure ulcers um, or injuries is because he had back surgery and the back surgery took about six hours and he was laying prone for um, that entire time on a metal operating table. And at this time he was 19 years old. So he's super healthy beautiful intact skin. And still he got these non blanchable reddened areas over bony prominences. So this is underneath his rib cage here on both sides. And this would be his hip bone right here. Funny thing is he had this surgery and he had a scar. I have pictures of this scar further down in this presentation, but when he woke up from the surgery, he complained more about the pain of these areas than he did his actual incision. So it was really painful. Um, lucky for him, he did not have to be prone for much, you know, for any longer after he got out of the OR. 
and he was young and healthy and his skin healed up, you know, fine. So here we have our stage two. So this is a partial thickness skin loss. Um, may also present as an intact or open ruptured blister. It can be shiny. It can be dry, but it's a very shallow ulcer. It has no slough, no bruising. Um, it can be caused by tape burns or skin tears. It's the loss of the dermis presenting a shallow open ulcer. So here is a picture of a stage two. As you can see, it is over that trochanter. Um, well, no, that looks more coxic in nature, but bony prominence either way. Our stage three pressure injury, the defining factor of stage two or stage three is that a stage three goes down into our subcutaneous layer. Okay, so fat may be visible, but the bone and tendon are not exposed at this point. Slaw may be present, and I'm sorry, but you guys are going to have to wait to see a picture of slaw. Maybe in the next one. Yeah, in the next picture, you'll have that. Uh, it does not obscure the depth of tissue loss. So it may be there, but it's not covering up the entire wound, occluding us from being able to see how deep it goes. Um, it may include a little bit of undermining and tunneling. You can see right here, the wound is going a little bit under those intact layers of the top layer of the skin. So here, so here is a picture then of a stage three. It's a little deeper. It goes deeper than a, just a sh very shallow stage two. Um, and this is what slaw looks like. So it's like a thick, very tenacious yellow substance in wound beds. Okay, a stage four is full thickness tissue loss, exposing our bone, tendon, or muscle. Um, slaw or eshkar may be present on some of the parts of the wound bed, uh, but again, not the entire wound bed because that would make it an unstageable. Um, but it often has the undermining, which is here, and tunneling. Um, I'll have I'll show you pictures of tunneling as well. So this is a picture here of a stage four. You can see right here that would be our tunneling or undermining, and we have tendon and bone showing, tendon or bone, whichever one that is. Here is a picture of the unstageable wound, um, and this is why. So. This is a full thickness tissue loss, uh, but you can't tell because as you can see in this picture here, it's got that dark Eshkar necrotic tissue all the way to the top. So just looking at the wound, you can't see how far it goes down. So it's an unstageable wound. This wound would be taken into an operating room and the patient would have to go under general anesthesia, most likely, and this would have to all be cut away, all this dead tissue, because your wound can never heal if it's being blocked with this necrotic tissue. So you can see here, this is a very, very, very bad wound, and this right here would be Eshkar, and it would be unstageable. And this one as well. So, you know, in seeing wounds like this throughout my career, once they take this wound into the operating room and debreed it of all of this necrotic tissue, this may be a very open, you know, full thickness gaping wound. And in this case, the patient would need a wound vac. And so the wound vacuum would be placed and it's like a foam dressing that gets placed inside the wound bed. And then the vacuum, you know, is like gently pulling out air sort of in a negative pressure fashion to help the skin close um, over time. So it's a very, very long healing process. So here's our diagram of the suspected deep tissue injury. Again, the skin is on tact on the surface, or the skin is intact on the surface, but you can see that it is purple maroon colored um, below the skin surface. It may be um, 
filled with blood. It may be a blood filled blister and this injured tissue under here is not going to be perfusing. So it will lead, you know, to a more extensive wound over time. So a suspected deep tissue injury here. So we don't know what's going on under here. And here's another one. This looks like the heel. So skin is intact, but a big boggy, dark maroon, dark purple area of damage underneath the skin. So we have undermining and tunneling here. Uh, you would want to measure this. The undermining goes right under the healthy layers of skin and the tunneling goes, you know, under the wound into the wound bed. This can be, th this can actually cause so many complications. A tunneling wound also can be called a sinus tract and it's a narrow opening or passageway underneath the skin that can extend in any direction through the soft tissue. And it results in what we call dead space. And in the dead space, bacteria can form, it can, can cause an abscess, um, which is a big um, infection under the skin that needs to be drained and treated. It can also, in some cases, tunnel all the way through into like another, um, another structure. So if it, it, it can tunnel into, you know, your large intestines or your bladder, and then urine's leaking into the tissues or stool, and it can become very, very problematic. So these things need to be discovered. And the way that we treat dead space is that we pack it with, um, like a long stringy gauze. Sometimes it's, um, it's impregnated with like an antibiotic or some kind of medication. And you would push the little string of gauze into the tunneling and change it however often it's prescribed to be changed and hoping that that's filling up the dead space and the healing process can start going, you know, from inside out with the gauze um, kind of guiding the healing process. Undermining can go underneath the intact tissue. So it usually happens underneath like a wound margin. So here is some pictures of tunneling. Undermining goes under the wound or under the healthy skin and tunneling goes in any direction underneath the wound. So we would want to measure it. And is what we do in our charts is we measure our wound, we measure the undermining or the sinus tracts, um, the tunneling. We also uh, measure the with the exudate, which is like the drainage. There's I have slides on that one too, and the odor. So get to know your Braden score. I cut off the title on this. That's irritating. But this is your Braden score. And so this can help you assess how at risk your patients are for developing pressure injuries. So upon admission, you would do this Braden score on all of your patients and they get a score for what's going on here. Um, so for us, you know, we have good sensory perception. We know when our heels are starting to hurt and we will move them. So we have no impairment. Um, moisture, we're hopefully not sitting in moisture all the time. So we have no impair impairment there. We're walking. We have no limitations on our mobility and our, our nutrition is excellent. Is that safe for me to say in nursing school that we have excellent nutrition? But yes, for the most part, we check all the boxes for the, you know, what we need. So let's talk on the flip side, then somebody who is confined to a bed, who's had a stroke and has sensory impairment, you know, they're in their eighties and they don't have the same pain receptors that they used to have and they can't swallow. Okay. So we have very poor nutrition. We're completely immobile. We're bed fast, constantly in our brief 
in our you know own urine feces and we have a sensory perception so that person is going to be very at risk and so is what we want to know and why we want to do this is we need to make sure that we're being very aggressive with our protected devices and moving our patients the every two hours that they need to be moved. So these are some of the protective devices. Um, this is a heel protector. They, they have fancy ones now that I've seen more like this one. Not only does this boot protect the patient's skin and heels from a pressure injury, but it also holds the foot at a 90 degree angle so they do not get foot drop which is a topic we will cover in mobility. Um, we have elbow protectors. This right here is called a Mepilex dressing. This is wonderful. It's brilliant. It's so cushiony and soft. And a lot of times, well, at least when I worked at one specific hospital, everyone who had a Braden score of a certain amount got one of these Mepilex dressings, whether they had a wound or not, because it was preventative in nature. And um, it's a it's a dressing. It's kind of like a bandage, but it's silicone, and so you can peel it off very easily. It doesn't have adhesive on it, and so you could assess the the area daily, and then also clean you know take it off and clean it easily if if it's got soiled with urine or stool. And then this right here, they have special like things have come a long way. There are specialty mattresses now for people who um, are at risk for having a pressure injury, but this right here is like a little waffle blow up mattress that you can put on. It just diffuses the hard surface so that um, the patients aren't just laying on one firm mattress. Um, this right here, and so this is excoriation. Uh, this, you know, this is a picture of a baby, obviously, with a horrible diaper rash, but this can happen in adults as well, um, especially adults who are frail and elderly and in their briefs. But so this is from, you know, laying in stool, urine. Um, it's sort of like a impairment of the tissues from laying in that acidic environment. This right here is maceration. Uh, from being in moist environments all the time. So this impairs your skin. I mean, you can look at this picture here and you can see that this is, you know, definitely already impaired skin integrity. So should anything else uh, assault this area of the skin, um, a wound is likely to happen. So this is granulation tissue here. It's red and beefy and kind of like chunky looking, but this is good tissue. So when you have a wound and you see this kind of tissue, you don't want to scrape that off. You don't want to, you know, scrub it with gauze. You want to leave this here because this means that our wound bed is healing. Anything that's like red and beefy and pretty and shiny like this is good. I will show you the bad in this next slide. Okay, this right here, bad. Eschgar, the black, um, black, dark, necrotic tissue, dry, it's dry too. And then slaw. So slaw is a soft yellow or white tissue. It's attached to the wound bed and it has to be removed surgically. You can't just wipe that off. It has to be removed um, you know, in the OR, by a doctor. And so uh, the slaw can really impair healing as well. Whoa, that was fancy. Okay, so acute wounds. So I have lots of pictures for you guys because I am a visual learner. Okay, so these are lacerations. Um, this is my old coworker's husband's leg. And this is my son's arm. And that's his arm after it got sutured. So he did this when he was skateboarding and uh, caught his arm on the top of a chain link fence. He was supposed to be in school that day, by the way. These are abrasions. So the superficial layer of the tissue is removed. Um, this can happen in motorcycle accidents, you know, um, trips and falls. They're pretty easy to treat. You do need to clean them. 
and put like a triple antibiotic ointment like bacitracin or neosporin on these wounds, but um, you know, they're not very deep. But having said that, since they're not very deep, they're like right at the nerve layer and they can be extremely painful. So I had one time when I was um, in the trauma room, I had a, a girl who came in with a motorcycle accident and she had abrasions all over her shoulder and her arm and her thigh. And it was um, embedded with gravel and dirt. So we had to clean it. And was how I would go about doing that is I would put lidocaine jelly in it first to try to numb the area. But of course, when you put lidocaine on, it hurts really bad at first and then it numbs the area. But she was so cute because we had to like brace ourselves together to put the lidocaine on her abrasions. And we did the countdown <laughs> And I just, I remember her, she was fun, but yes, embedded in gravel. And so we had to clean that out. More abrasions. Um, this one here is a contusion. A contusion is an injury under the skin. The skin is not broken. That is my daughter. She fell out of a bounce house. So it's resulting from a forceful blow to the skin uh, and the soft tissue. However, the outer layer of the skin is intact. So here's a contusion of the eye. This is a puncture wound. Um, let's see what it says about. So sharp object enters the skin. These wounds are usually small and don't bleed a lot, but don't be fooled by a puncture wound because it may be very deep. And I know you guys probably have heard this on, you know, Gray's Anatomy or whatnot, but you don't want to pull this out until you're in like a hospital ER setting because you don't know what this object in this picture, uh, the nail is occluding. And if you pull it out, you know, it may be occluding like an artery or something, and then it'll bleed a lot. So you leave it in until you're in a safe setting of a hospital. Okay, you guys have to brace yourself for the next picture. Ready? Okay, so that's my sister's neck and she got bit by a husky. Uh, it was crazy too, actually. So this is a puncture wound. I mean, these look pretty deep. You can see how deep they are in her ear too. But this one right here was like a millimeter from her carotid artery, which is right here. <laughs> if she had been bit there, she would have bled to death in like less than a minute. So yeah, good that that didn't happen. So the next ones we're going to talk about are avulsions. Avulsions is when a section of your tissue is actually torn off, either partially or in total. Um, so this, the skin is elevated or, or in a partial avulsion, the skin is elevated off of the actual, you know, part of the body but it's still attached. So these pictures are also quite disturbing. So another way that people can, cut, can talk about an avulsion is it is a degloving of sorts. So you can deglove your ankle here, you can deglove your hand. So look, it looks like he's taking off a glove. In this case, you know, you'd have to wash all of this out with antibiotic. I don't know if this would be able to be sutured, uh, maybe, but you might, your, your patient might actually need to have skin grafts. Gunshot wounds. Gunshot wounds are really tricky because um, sometimes you don't know where the exit is or where the entrance is. And then once it goes inside the body, you know, it can bounce around and hit structures or not. I've actually taken care of people before who were shot once and died. And I've taken care of people who have been shot six times and miraculously, absolutely nothing important was injured by the bullet. So it depends on where the bullet enters and, ent and exits. So more pictures of abrasions. Contusions. Contusions can be, you know, really big. That definitely indicates internal bleeding on this one here, the guy. 
more avulsions. I'm going to end here and I will pick up with wound dressings on our next video. I think what an hour is long enough. See you guys in the next video.